All right, I'm still calculating numbers here. Not 400 millions we, we can save. 400 billion, right, it's not million. So if we bring back 100,000 of those people back to the army, that's a huge amount of the budget. Right, very, very much so. And we don't even have that money, right? So I can say that 400 billions, just to compare, to defend all of our energy systems, we allocated a little over than 50 billion. To compare more, Ukrainians gathered over two years slightly above 50 billion. So 400 billion, that's eight times all the donations over two years. So what, is it that difficult to gather these people back? Just entrust this to me, I can do it. All right, 100%. Let's get to other news. We, It's a very entertaining rabbit hole, but uh, let's... Um, Henrik, I, I do have one task in one sentence. My task is to make sure our citizens, compatriots, start thinking. I want them to start using their brains, not emotions. All right. Thank you. What else is done since last week? Our president executed limitation for the online casinos. The bill instructs to install limits on the use of casinos, to implement limits of expenses, implement online system of monitoring, block illegal casinos, and implement limits for military to use casinos. Security Service of Ukraine was tasked with conducting all the checks in regards to that bill and people are criticizing this bill because they say SBU will be able to reshuffle the market of online casinos in the interests of certain parties and nothing will actually slow down in terms of betting and one more thing Alexei, I want to add here all those who have ever played it would be good if casino you're using would publish on their front page the amount of options what are the odds for playing in this casino so that every serviceman or any citizen would understand their mathematics. Do they even have a chance in these things, or they do not? Nikolai, let's also expose the end beneficiaries of these casinos, because 85% of them are citizens of Russian Federation. Look, three problems of Ukraine. First, needed laws are not adopted. Second, if they are adopted, they are not being executed upon. And third, Right, you can just bleep over the third. It is very good that we adopted this bill. Let's see how that will be implemented. I have concerns that those people who will be monitoring it will sum it up saying that they might lower a little bit, but generally they'll just redirect the, flow, the streams of money to different parties. Remember, on the other hand, there was a limitation in Adnaklasniki, classmates, Russian network and Vkontakte, Russian network the visits from Ukraine really fell down. So even if we just enforce the use of VPNs, basically block it here, that will probably lead to some good results. And as always, for complex issues, you need to bring complex solutions. Analyze the reasons, analyze the flows and options, and implement different tools. If we manage to drop it down five times, perhaps not fully eradicate, that will be already a fantastic achievement. All right, our Polish friends, first time in the last two and a half months, they deblocked an access point, Jagodin Daragusk. This is the biggest point for transit, and the truck transport has resumed. That was uh, started back on the 9th of February, and now it is open. Uh, Mr. Tusk, Polish president, asked Polish people to help Ukrainian friends. Yeah, I think decision was already made and he just hyped a bit on this public relations. Anyway, let's imagine that uh, he called upon them to deblock it and they followed his advice. Now, there's a continuation to that. Minister of Foreign Affairs, Weekly Mirror's publication, Ukrainian publication, blocked access for Ukrainian citizens of the conscription age that uh, they would not have any judicial and consulate support in the countries where they are outside of Ukraine, outside of returning back to Ukraine. So, once again, how can we do that to our own citizens? Calling them criminals and limiting consular services. Do you know that consular services cannot be limited? 
our constitution provides for that. So our constitutional court needs to awaken and pitch in into this problem and try to unblock it. But they're asleep for some reason. So here we go. Even a criminal can get consulate services while they're, for example, in jail, in penitentiary system overseas, they can still get the documents from our embassy, but a free Ukrainian overseas cannot. He is being suggested to return back to the country to serve in the army from where 100,000 people just fled and return and bring value to the economy that is also being mismanaged. What is it? We've built the country for people, but I start to feel like I'm in the old Soviet anecdote. Do you know what it said, what it sounded like? Everything for human, everything in honor of human. Yeah, well, I was in Moscow, I've seen that human. That's a similar situation here. People are gathering in communities, societies and countries to live well. But if they're gathering into communities and after that they live worse, and I will say a scary thing, but obvious thing, actually. I think it's obvious for everybody, they're just afraid to talk about it that Ukrainians are living worse in Ukraine than in any other country of the world, perhaps outside of Russia and Belarus. Anywhere, Italy, Germany, United States, they are doing better. They have more freedoms, their rights are better protected. How come? Why have we been building Ukraine in such a fashion that it used to be, it was supposed to become a shelter for Ukrainians, right? Like Israel became a shelter for Jews where Ukrainian would not be attacked in Ukraine, right? We, the idea was the similar, but we were just trying to exacerbate and make it even worse. And now let's look at the election promises, which uh, just hit the five years marker. What happened? Where did all the constitutional majority support go for, right? Constitutional majority that Zelensky got allowed him to carry out anything. Yesterday, by the way, there was the first day of the voting in the second two or five years ago when President Zelensky had won. Would you perhaps briefly like to summarize the results of these five years? What was good? What was right? Among the good moments, very successful international politics after the beginning of the war. And that's it. I don't have anything good to praise his government for. I'm saying as somebody who spent two and a half years out of these five years in the office of the president. It is a catastrophe. It is not management. It is catastrophe. His results, especially given the hopes, given the spring of 19, how many people believed that it will be better. And everything was so fruitlessly drained down the sewer. All the serious tasks were not stated. Everything went into the media bubble. And there are a couple explanations, not even excuses. There were two COVIDs and a war, but still, all the crisis, they're only exacerbating circumstances, they're aggravating circumstances there, because at every crisis you can actually realize additional things that you would not be able to get people's support in uh, normal times. And having constitutional majority had all the instruments in Ukraine, in the country that is being torn apart by internal groups and different opinions, this is a chance that falls on a president once, not even in a hundred years, in a thousand years probably, and just drain it all down the sewer. Cultural policy, cultural agenda drained. International politics is the strongest card of this administration still, even though it's limping, but still it is the strongest suit. A peace formula is a good proposal, just needs more work, and they're somehow getting some support there. Military policy is very contradictory, very complex. I'm not even talking about 20th, 21st, with all the conclusions for the army. Military industrial complex was not really developed during these years pre-war. Economic politics, catastrophe, social semi-catastrophe. Ukrainians, instead of becoming more united, they are more disorganized now. There is more hatred within the society. And now a third of them is outside the country and everything is done to make sure they never come back or they are labeled as traitors. And 
I think the president should be judged by the economic results, by the rights of people at the end of his rule, how protected they are, and uh, the degree of unity within a society, ideas for the future, the feeling of camaraderie and brotherhood, that this is ours, right? And we have everything with a negative sign, except for external politics. This is definitely strong, cannot argue there. Really, we're getting good support, he's uh, getting results in very difficult circumstances. But that's it. All right. There is also that period starting when there likely will be more stories about illegitimacy, about usurper at the helm of the country. Once again, on this day, I would ask you, how do we treat it during the time when Zelensky will be running this country without elections? What is our attitude? Well, understandably, we will not call him illegitimate. That will be too much. He's a supreme commander-in-chief in the country at war. Even if we considered him to be legitimate, it is dangerous to call him this title, because that would be a crisis of power in the country that is uh, facing very difficult decisions. Then who signed these laws for mobilization, right? Russia will definitely throw all weight to prove that he is illegitimate. And one of the questions they will come up with, all right, peace treaty, but who will be signing it? What legal rights does Zelensky have to put the signature? Who is he? without elections. We have conducted elections, Russians would say, in war times, however uh, bad they are. Europe will say they have conducted elections. America is going to have election cycle this year. So we need to have an answer, and an answer needs to be provided by an organ that is not responsible, that is not responding or is not under a president. So that would be a uh, constitutional court of Ukraine. And they need to come out and explain that presidential rights are extended for the period, and then he would have legal basis. There is a decision by parliament, a decision by constitutional court. This is what needs to be done. But it is difficult to approach constitutional court with uh, judges suggested by the president. You know how it ended up with when one of the candidates was asked when was our constitution adopted? The candidate didn't even know when that happened, right? That tells you about the candidates suggested with the approval of the president. Constitutional power is really pissed at our current executive power. So this situation is very questionable and very much hanging in the air. So as always, we'll probably do it like this. Close your eyes and say everything is okay. Nobody is against us and I think we are fine. But they will be pushing from the outside. Even if we manage to hold it inside, it will be questioned from the outside and partners and opponents and foes like Russia. And who will be signing the peace treaty, right? So let's take that framework that we talked about before, about realistic scenarios where there will be no negotiations. Then the question will continue rising more and more. Look, we don't know what shape will take the difference between the 25th of May 2024 and other decisions that will be unpopular, especially inside of Ukraine. Because sooner or later, there will be a couple of interesting American congressmen when they'll be adopting another package, who will bring up the question, his status is questionable, whom are we giving this money and this equipment? Who is getting these tens of billions of dollars? And that topic will be peddled by Russia ad nauseum, and they will probably go berserk even before the 25th of May. And this will have some response in the international society. Most countries will support us, they understand that during times of war, etc. But this topic will not be left to rest, and you would not be able to navigate around it quietly. And if situation will be getting worse, especially internally, there will be a lot more questions popping up even inside the Ukraine. It needs to be resolved somehow. By law, we need to have a decision by constitutional court. This is the one that you could present both inside and outside. Right, at least it's some government institute that is specializing in these difficult questions and can produce their verdict. I think there was a statement by VP of election committee 
who said that, or explained rather, that after the first term, after the first constitutional term of Zelensky, the second term is not his second term technically, it is continuation of the first term. And this is the explanation on the level of election committee, not on the level of constitutional court. I do love our election committee separately and combined. Really, I do like them. They are very professional. But this is not their right to explain these things. They express their position. We are thankful to them for this. But unfortunately, it doesn't have a proper weight with the international community. We need something heavier. And it appears that in the United States, while adopting this aid package, a couple of them already came out. Marjorie Taylor Greene came out with uh, questions. And Marjorie, yeah, she's a special person, but she will not be alone. So we do need, do or die, we do need this decision from the constitutional court that has international weight in this regard. Internally, we can figure it out, but internationally, we do need to have a proper order. Even though during the war, it, the topic of elections is very complex. But if that will continue, this topic will be coming up over and over again. And even internally, when it uh, hits certain moods with the population, probably in November. Viktor Orban also made a couple of statements this week. He says, as long as we do have a national government, Hungary will not go to war. And uh, it was published in one of their main media sources that was saying that the West is one step away from joining Ukraine on the front. And he was saying that we do not, do not want war, we do not want Hungary to become a toy of great powers. And that sending our people to war will lead to the big third war, third world war, and we do not want it. Well, that's a good news, I guess, right? The question, Alexei, is the West really one step away from sending their troops in reasonable quantities? I can say that discussion is indeed going. It's a real discussion. Not snotty attempts to form some public opinion, not attempts to bring Russia to some strategic ambiguity, but real serious attempts and plans are discussed. When do you think we can see some realization of these plans? Well, they are scenario-based. No. What is the scenario plan? It is a two or three step. If A, then B, right? So, if A doesn't happen, then B doesn't happen. And frankly, we don't really need Western army here, but we need Western weapons and correct internal politics. So, why are you saying, Alexei, that we don't need Western army on our territory? Is it the question of sovereignty or some other questions here? Right. So, not we don't need them in the manner of never send them. No, I would appreciate them being here. But situation doesn't demand them to be here, 100%. If they do come, that's, that'll be good, though. Why, why are you saying the situation doesn't ask for it? Because I think, uh, Nikolai, that we have all capabilities to resolve these matters ourselves. We just need proper support. Now, if they come and start fighting, it's like in that old anecdote, when a young man is proposing to the daughter of a millionaire and is asking why do you not love me because I'm a penniless student without a Jaguar and a golden card and a million in the bank? And she answers, you know, women love men not for Jaguar, not for a credit card, not for a million in the bank. But if you have all that, you will not be liked less. So we are in a similar condition. We can win this war or get acceptable results even without French and Czech and other armies. But if they will be here, we will not be loving them less, right? That's for sure. So it would be fantastic if great specialists would come, if aviation would arrived, uh, could have uh, even been in some volunteer foreign legion format, but um, they're not coming yet. They're discussing it. Discussing, but not coming. You know. So what do you think, Alexei? Are they doing scenario planning and preparing themselves just in case for a situation if something happens? No, no, Nikolai, they already planned everything. Now 
They are just waiting for a set of circumstances to unfold. All right. I will be satisfied with this answer, I think. Poland is ready to allow NATO to place nukes on its territory. Andrzej Duda made official statement that the country can allow nukes to be placed on their territory in a format of an exchange with NATO allies. And how do you think real his uh, suggestion is? Absolutely real. This is uh, already an established practice. There already are American nukes in some countries. If nukes can be in Turkey, in Germany, in Italy, of course they can be in Poland, given that there is a risk coming from Russia. That's a parity answer. From a tactical point of view, from operative strategic point of view, you don't really need it there, but it is a political gesture. You are threatening us with nukes? Medvedev tweets, well, here you go, there is some nukes around you too. This is a demonstration. A demonstration of intent in case of, if you will be blackmailing us. We have guns too, and we have plutonium in some of the ammo as well. All right. About Russian response to American aid, many observers mentioned that Russia is uh, in some sort of stupor after these news came about. Yeah, they seriously are. According to my sources, they were thinking that they're bluffing and they're expecting the West to bluff as well. But apparently the West wasn't. They just don't know it all. And probably they were not estimating it correctly. But the more interesting it is, they really are in some sort of stupor. And their plans are going down the drain as well. At first, the West interjected their initiative with nuclear ultimatums. And now they also were hoping that um, there will be no aid coming from the United States. Don't know how they calculated that, but now they really are at a loss quite a bit. They were hoping to go and break through Donetsk region and then suggest the Serdovan plan. But now Donetsk region is really not going to be taken, doesn't want to be. Lugansk and Zaporozhye and Kharkov, everything is kind of crumbling for them. Now what, blackmail? But oops, Poland got nukes now placed in there, perhaps. And there is also a cordial accord between France and Britain, two nuclear powers readying for a conflict. They wanted to bluff, and the West responded with real action. Oops. And now you need to raise the stakes, but what do you do that with? With not finished 14th Army Corps that's supposed to be threatening Poland, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia and Finland? They have maybe 35,000 troops in this corps right now, and Polish army is 150. Finnish is 250 when they deploy, and so on. Who, who, will, who will win in this case? Well, another popular opinion that's also voiced in Ukraine, Alexei, who thought that Russians need to attack Europe? They will never do that. They don't need it. Well, first of all, purveyors of this opinion, you are wrong. I'll tell you about the blown up warehouses in Czech Republic, attempt to assassinate Prime Minister of Chernogoria, and attempt to conduct terrorist activities uh, in Chernogoria as well. Russian criminals are brought to justice for that, by the way. Real events. They do not need to have a hot war with Europe. I said about that uh, many times. But they do need a fifth article crisis with Europe to break them apart, to be able to negotiate separately with each country, to use the urban model, to buy them and to scare them. These are their plans. They understand that they'll never stand a chance to really fight with the West. They had a very iffy proposition and were likely to fail even if the West didn't mobilize. But now it's even worse for them. So they were hoping that their bluff will prevail and the West will be toothless opponent. The West was pushing away this topic. The West ran away from Afghanistan. And you know why Russians attacked Ukraine, they basically made a decision that the West is rotten. 
and there is nothing to be afraid of. And behavior of the West at the beginning of this war and before this war was rather convincing of that theory. But they were scaring them a bit too much and screaming that the West is fighting with them. So the West finally showed up. They are not really fighting yet, but they came to the table and said, well, if we have to, we will. And the whole rhetoric is now changing. So if the West really engages, what will happen? Alexei, how do you think they can fight with that leftist agenda in the West? That seems like their big weakness. Right, let's remind our viewers that left projects and militarism are very well aligned. Hyper-militaristic country, as the Soviet Union, is a good proof of that. With a lot of wars, during uh, the whole time of its existence, there were wars that Soviet Union participated in. China is another militarist country example, and with that they're also trying to rival United States. There are five aircraft carriers and vessels uh, of a larger number than US Navy, and this is a left project overall. So left, they do fight, they can be aggressive. Most of wars in the United States were started by Democrat globalists, so leftists. The right out of a bunch of recent wars uh, were started by the left, only maybe one or two were started by the right presidents. So, you did mention before that leftist agenda is a big problem for them, though. Right, it is a big problem, but in a different fashion. They will still fight if they have to. That's uh, if A, then B. And they definitely are not afraid of Russia. They are concerned with uh, Russian falling apart scenario, because then there will be a humanitarian crisis, uncontrolled nukes, and they're concerned with um, perhaps rolling into a nuclear warfare. That is a serious issue. These um, talks about placing nukes in Poland are direct answer to Russian nuclear blackmail. Russia planned this year for nuclear blackmail, and NATO is preemptively answering. So, the attacks on oil refineries because of Ukrainian activities, Russian oil refining product fell down to the lowest level, lowest annual level. In April, their product was about 5.23 million barrels uh, per day, which is the lowest level since May of last year. Bloomberg sources mentioned that rebuild and reconstruction of the damaged oil refineries is going very slow. Also, additional flood in Orsk uh, stopped another oil refinery recently, and I heard an opinion that the attacks on oil refineries are so threatening for Russian government that they can actually bring to Russia disintegration and serious crisis on economic reasons. No, this is a little too much, but this is definitely very painful. We can even see that uh, Americans came over, Austin and company came in with uh, asks to not attack them. But I can say that our capabilities are growing. By autumn, Russia will have not only oil refineries destroyed, but also a couple other branches of economy damaged. We probably will lose a couple more because of their missiles, and uh, likely can continue until we're both in rubbles. So, the good part of it is that they were expecting to be playing only in one go, that they'll be just hitting on the Ukrainian goal and there'll be no answer. By the way, I'm getting notes that Kharkov is under attack now. There are very big explosions there and um, I have relatives living there too and friends. So, guys, we're with you. Thank you for standing strong. Take shelter. But I want to say that Russia definitely miscalculated. Russian territory is very vulnerable strategic level vulnerability is uh, that huge territory. Actions by Russian Volunteer Corps have a huge value in this regard, and oil refineries attacks have a good value in this regard, and destruction of Black Sea Fleet is also another strategic advantage. And these are not the only good cards that we have, and they'll be more realized. So Russia as superpower has certain features that it cannot protect, uh, where it cannot protect itself. 
One of them is the territory. There will be no time in history when Russia will have so much air defense systems to be able to cover its whole territory or at least even the most important objects. So even if they move their defense systems to protect oil refineries, we will switch our attacks to a different target. This task is technologically not solvable for them to stop us from doing it. And we will continue. This is uh, changing the layout. And given that they are, they've reached the plateau in this production, um, we are still evolving. For example, on the Russian side, they cannot be producing much armor. It's uh, slowed down significantly in terms of speed and uh, volume produced. And we continue to evolve in the UAV segment. So if they were hoping that we'll die, we'll definitely make sure that we fall into the abyss, uh, closely hugging them and taking them with us. So they're feeling it. That's why they're making those peace suggestions. Otherwise, we would not see them. In your opinion, Alexei, in these conditions, when American aid is already provided, scenario is going in a certain framework for this year, what can Russia do even in their best scenario? For example, do you think they can take some territories in Donetsk and Lugansk and this will solve some matters for them? No, it won't solve it for them. They understand that this war was a big mistake. They have a small marginal group that is still rooting for war, out of which I think it's 6% of all population. And uh, their leader, Strelkov, uh, one of them, is uh, sitting in jail now. Most of Russians are for finishing this war. Over 70% would appreciate peace negotiations. They understand that they cannot win this war. And they're not talking about heroic occupations, they're talking about justification for this war. They understood that it's a big mistake back in March of 22, Putin saw that. But they need to find an excuse why was it started and why casualties were so big, what for? And that's the only thing that's holding them. If they didn't have issues with uh, people back in Russia asking questions, they would probably have withdrawn and paid their operations already. But they don't have a scenario, they don't have, they don't know what, what, how to explain this war in this way. So, instead of sending us Istanbul suggestions, I would tell them, send us other options. I actually do have a scenario that they, we can recommend them to use. If they will need it at some point, I'll tell them. Who needs? Russians, you mean? Right, Russians. If they have questions, uh, they can reach out. You can, I can tell you like that. I can tell you here in a stream. So what are you suggesting? I talked about back uh, that back in March of 22. And I will say not what I'm thinking about now, but I was talk I will tell you what did I say at the negotiations back then. So imagine I am the president of Russian Federation. And they're screaming denazification, demilitarization. So I would come out in this case and say, dear Russians, we have reached the goals of this operation. On the international negotiations, let's say Istanbul, we reached an agreement to end this war. The only barrier to this event was the position of some neo-Nazi fraction in Ukraine. But we, with the West, with China, with India, with the overall global community, thanks to the soldiers of our army who stubbornly resisted all the fight and the threats from all over the world and carried it on. We have come to an agreement and thanks to our diplomacy and my personal concern as a president brought to Ukrainian people denouncing the fascist and Nazist uh, leanings and those groups and factions. So we precluded their attempts to attack Russian territory, we demilitarized them, and demilitarization means that not a single Ukrainian shell will hit Russian territory anymore. Russia is well protected for years to come, that means our soldiers did not die in vain. So there will be no war. And look, they were entering Belgrade region, they were hitting our refineries, now they won't do anymore. And there is some causation in it, and Russian populace at large will generally eat it. The main thing, it's uh, right, they won't even, I don't think they'll deduce that they were hitting our refineries be, because we attacked them, but they'll eat it that, hey, they're not doing it anymore. 
then we can demobilize our military from 1,300,000, we go back down to 300,000, right? And Russia can play on that too and say, well, look, the West is not fighting, Ukrainian army is uh, lesser, so it's demilitarized. An army went down to 300,000 from a million three hundred. Nobody will be fighting with war, they will not join NATO, and it doesn't quite matter if we will or not, they can say that, right? And as for Europe, sure, they can go to their LGBTQ Europe, whatever. Uh, but Russia is protected, and now Eastern Europe has a collective system of security. And our ultimatum to Europe was uh, to stop NATO expansion, and there were five years of NATO expansion in the recent times, and only now, after we have conducted a brilliant special military operation, we have forced Ukraine to leave their intent of joining NATO. This is a huge achievement, and Russia was fighting alone against the whole world. And this is the position, this is the formula. Um, ultimately, they'll outline that together with the West, at the end, they stopped Ukraine from Nazification. And that will be eaten, that will be consumed by their people. Well, listen, but for this, Russia doesn't need anyone. Yeah, they don't really need anyone to go this way. But they first need to get deeply convinced that you and I here are correct. They already suspect that it's correct. They just, the only thing that's hold them is a lack of strategy inside of Russia. How do you explain half a million losses in Ukraine? They need to achieve something. They may be hoping that we'll give them four regions. Well, of course not. At any referendum, no, we won't. So that's why I'm, I said back in the day, two years ago, how we can leave uh, this situation. Uh, sorry, I apologize. I do want to drink. This is this doesn't look like water. Sorry, it does. It is water. <laughs> it it really is water. I don't have a glass here, and it's yeah, drinking from bottle. <laughs> sorry. All right, we have a couple more news about the events happening not too far. For example, what do you think will happen in uh, Zagavkazia, in uh, Caucasus? Armenia, Russian troops, etc. Right, let's make a compliment to Azerbaijan. I'm reading that in comments already. How come? Russians are withdrawing their troops and even their peacekeepers. Well, I did tell you back two years ago, a couple of years ago I was commenting the war of 2020, and then there were some losses of Russian peacekeepers after that, there were some flares in this conflict, and then you're asking, well, Russia will be protecting some of the annexations and the Azerbaijan territories. I told you, I told you that uh, Russia will withdraw, it won't even be five years when they'll withdraw from there. How many years have passed? Four. And now they are withdrawing. Because I saw what Azerbaijan leadership was doing. I don't know what they see from inside, but from the outside, it does see, it does look like they are conducting a rather flawless strategy. And those Russians who naively think that they still manage something in Caucasus, they are being weaved into the eastern carpet and uh, left in the position where they just have to pray to be let go. Today, Ilham Aliyev was meeting with Putin in Moscow. Azerbaijan is a serious player, and it has a more serious player of Turkey behind them. And there was a General Secretary of NATO visit to Azerbaijan, by the way. And Armenia is already saying goodbye to Russian border guards, leaving the CSTO agreement. You can know that Pashinyan shows also a rather high class of game. He destroyed Karabakh clan that was holding Armenian people as hostages, was getting most money from Moscow, and causing a lot of ruckus in that region. Re-legitimized himself, he conducted another election, so he is there, and he continues to conduct his politics. So Moscow is facing a fiasco in Caucasus region as well. And one can admire the level of gameplay by Azerbaijan, who has 150 Russian-speaking uh, schools in Baku, or maybe that's a whole country, but it's a huge number. And they teach uh, in Russian in their universities, being uh, having Turkish uh, or Turk uh, group of languages right there at their core. 
and having suffered just as much as Ukraine from Russian Empire, they've played a good game. They developed their own culture. They did not allow to extinguish any other culture. So not a single Ukrainian, Russian or anybody who uh, is uh, there from the old USSR times doesn't feel himself threatened as a second degree citizen. And they have fought rather heroically for Karabakh region. They have heroes who were, had uh, Russian names, who were fighting for their motherland of Azerbaijan, uh, just of Russian descent. And Azerbaijan understood a very interesting point, that small countries, smaller people, who are making a choice to serve in the army together with the core people of this country, they are double heroes. They are not just uh, usual heroes, right? We're still not getting quite getting this in Ukraine. But when Russian or Armenian or Azerbaijan is living in Ukraine and taking arms to fight against Putin invasion, that's a heroic act. They could have gone back to their country, but they are dying for Ukraine. How many Azerbaijan fighters we have uh, who were lost uh, during this war? I've seen some messages from uh, Diaspora. I think it's uh, close to 20 already. They have lost a lot of Armenians and Hungarians from Zakarpati as well. We've been returning Hungarian servicemen from Russian prison. These are people who can get European passport, passport easily and leave the country, but they're fighting for us. How did we thank them? We suppressed their language or did not allow them to build more schools. We should be looking at Azerbaijan as a mirror and shouldn't be pushing that idiocy that we have had for a while. And we need to can understand and feel that thought that there is no heroism to be, to fight for this war for a title nation. There is some, but it's not too big of a figure. But those who are smaller nations and fighting for your country, these are double heroes. Ukrainian Greek can leave for Greece, Ukrainian German can leave for Germany, Ukrainian Azerbaijan can leave for Azerbaijan. They don't even need to go fight to the front, they remain, if they remain in the country, they are heroes. Ukrainian Tatars, they can go to Turkey, but they are fighting in certain battalions here. Who is the hero, right? We have Jews who are fighting for Ukraine, they could be fighting for Israel and leave for Israel, they definitely feel better in Israel than in Ukraine, but they're here and they're fighting. So once again, who is the real hero? Who is displaying a real loyalty to his country? And this attempt to divide into super people of the title nation and other people who are being taken as uh, smaller nations, does it remind you about anything? Aren't we fighting with this on the front? Why are we allowing for that to happen inside? Some people are blaming me as a traitor when I'm telling that I'm Russian. But did it hit your mind that Russian colonel of Ukraine armed forces, this is a compliment to Ukraine armed forces and to Ukraine as a country? This is like back in 2014, our Ukrainian officer, I think his last name was almost Ivanov, um, of Russian descent, who did shout this phrase, Russians never surrender, when he was offered by Putin's troops. And that's loyalty. This is loyalty to the country where, by the way, you're blamed for speaking Russian when you're being spat upon if you try to take a pose, take a stance that you're Russian. People who are fighting in our forces with that national background they project not double but quadruple heroism and loyalty. You're saying that Russians with Ukrainian passports are splitting the country apart. No, you talking about that are splitting the country apart. You're trying to make citizens of a second grade those who are displaying a highest degree of loyalty to the country and you're trying to expel them. This is not a path. Start measuring skulls soon, right, super people? As one good friend of mine said, however you push that topic, it always ends up being with National Socialism. And that uh, subject, even if you dress it in Ukrainian clothes, it still will be that same subject. 
And Azerbaijan is displaying more wits in this case. And that's why they overplayed Putin, they outplayed Putin, and they have prevailed in the war after a serious damage, serious defeat. They still grit their teeth and uh, in five years they got what they wanted. That's the class of a game. And it all starts with cultural politics, with cultural agenda. Which great and smart Ukraine that portrays itself as taking root from Yaroslav the Wise can still not reach the soul of Yaroslav the Wise in our country wisdom. I'm done with my speech. Listen, Alexei, in the cultural agenda and in these ideological questions, the matter of the central signal from president means a lot, right? If he sends a message to unite people and not to break them apart or ignore the issues, that plays probably the centerpiece role. Right, five years ago our president promised us that Ukrainians would not be divided into different classes of citizens. He was sending messages that he understands that issue, right? Remember his, not even a speech, but a reply in one of the meetings when he said, when he told Leshko, yeah, please uh, continue splitting people apart, you'll get far with this way. But why do you think he failed to carry this signal further into society? Nikolai, he, on, he does not only understands that, he belongs to a minority here. He's a Russian-speaking Jew in Ukraine, and Ukrainian people elected him as a president. And people, as the saying goes, people are grey but wise. But as the character of one of the movies, played by Robert Downey Jr., the judge, he's saying that the paradox is that 97% of Americans believe in some conspiracy, 50% believe in aliens, 60% believe in Area 51. But when these people gather together, individually, each of them cannot really say anything about justice. But, and, and usually whatever they say, that will probably cause a judicial community to laugh. But every time when you gather 12 of them together, they bring the best or the most, uh, the closest to truth verdict. That's that saying, that uh, people are grey but wise. You can pick one person individually and listen to his uh, judgment and statements about politics. You'll probably get a good laugh. You don't even need to go far. You can read comments under our videos. There are a lot of those who is the mediocre elector. But when they aggregate together, they somehow manage to guess what's needed. And Ukrainian people, with all our accusations of anti-Semitism and other issues we have, they managed to choose a Russian-speaking Jew in Ukraine because they understood that the model suggested by Poroshenko, army, speech and faith, is not a good fit for this country that we have. That was intuitive. And there were a lot of pushes back in the last term of Poroshenko with church and with faith and with army and uh, Ukrainian speech. And people basically said no in the first round, mostly for his cultural politics and national politics as well. And they suggested not the mono-ethnic project, the impossible Ukraine, but a wider, kind of like United States, more nations, a lot of cultures, a lot of faiths together, that work together to develop the country. Zelensky had won on this message. And as a result, under him, he tried to outdo Poroshenko, actually. And I have a question. Vladimir Alexandrovich, why did you do that? What for did you deceive and betray your electors? That brought you a catastrophe, ultimately, personal catastrophe for you, a catastrophe for the country at large. But from your personal point of view, I would argue that you shouldn't have done it. I understand, okay, well, deceived electors, that's one thing, but personally, and how the history will remember you. Or just let's bring the table of what was promised and not delivered. Because people were voting for, there is no difference, right? But they were voting for that, so that one Ukrainian would not be attacking the other if he speaks a different language or if he is of a different faith. 
And there is an ideal model for the country. One, Ukrainian government language, and everybody else has freedom. Why Ukrainian culture needs to develop by suppression of other cultures? Who decided that in 21st century? And now people can be talking all kinds of anti-colonial fairy tales and all. But the development of our culture right now goes through suppression of others. Why? What for? And this is to the matter of the end of his reign, of his results of uh, Zelensky in power. Still not too late to change things, but the main pump for anti-humanist ideas and ultra-mono project ideas is the official power of Ukraine right now. Even our nationalists are lagging behind the pro-government channels. That's uh, utter idiocy. What do you want to do? To lure Poroshenko supporters to your side? Well, see what they're writing to you on your annual five years celebration. What about the rest, 73% who voted for you, who gave unprecedented carte blanche to Zelensky to change the country's path and direction to the white project, to a more inclusive project? And I want to say, no military industrial complex, no rapid growth is possible without wide project, without over-encompassing project, because otherwise you'll only have supporters of mono-ethnic Ukraine supporting you. Everybody else will eventually leave, go to other places. And if you continue dividing Ukraine into different grades of citizens, monoculture a priori implies the priority of a title nation over everybody else however it is wrapped and candied. Those who are not the title nation, they feel it. If you gather 100,000 people who, who left their uh, troops, if you can ask them frankly about why did they leave, you'll hear a lot of things about second grade people and the culture of a second grade and how it feels to be a second grade. And a simple thought, that a graduate of Moscow University, academician Aliyev, got in his head, who had experience of living in a very difficult multicultural pot, which uh, Caucasus are. They figured out that all wars and all blood revenges start when people start to be suppressed by speaking the language which their mom talked to them in. When we are born, we do not choose Russian language as a principal choice. We do not proclaim, I am Russian. We do not choose the movie, or the language that a movie is in and the cartoons are in. This is the language that our moms talk to us in. A person cannot choose that. This is not given. This is beyond the choice. So why are you putting them in the second grade? while he stayed here in Ukraine, fighting for Ukraine, not being a title nation, donating for that country, and you're claiming him and them to be people of a second grade, for just they, they speak the language that their moms talk to them, for that. Azerbaijans were wise enough, and in a fascinating combination, they have won their war conflict, and they will polish it and finish it and continue evolving. And we're discussing whether we are, do not lose this war. And the root of it is in the internal politics, because, by the way, it is birthday of Lenin. One of his main thoughts was that foreign policy, foreign politics is always a continuation and reflection of the inner politics. And all our relations with our neighbors are continuation of our internal politics. And instead of understanding that and correcting it, we're only exacerbating this aspect. And we do not want to learn on our own blood, apparently. Alexei Nikolaevich, not much to add to me here, except for banning TikTok, but even there, there is not much to say in States, I mean, not in Ukraine. Thank you for this stream. Once again, we do support armed forces of Ukraine, and under each video, there is a fundraiser initiative for our troops, for armed forces that are gathering monies to buy UAVs and other equipment to continue carrying out their tasks 
at the front. Today we're supporting 25th Brigade that are gathering money for the ground drones that uh, help to evacuate wounded from the battlefront. They're gathering 500,000 hryvnas. These are their personal fundraiser. We never touch this money. They reach directly the units and their accounts. And not donation is too small. Right, and also children in Estonia. That's under... Uh, there's another link, right? It should have been added. Mm -hmm. It's there. Just checked. All right. Thank you. Guys, do not forget to click like and subscribe. Goodbye.